So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Matthew Kaplan. I'm a local pain physician here in the Round Rock, Austin area, primarily based right out of Round Rock, about 15 minutes down the road. I want to come today to talk about neuropathy. As a pain management doctor, it's probably the biggest thing that we're seeing in the elderly population now. And elderly, when we're saying 65 and older, we're actually seeing it in younger ages. Usually 55 and older, I'm having a lot of patients come in and complaining with the burning of my feet, pain here, they describe it sometimes as lancinating, and they say, you know, I've been here, I've been there, and no one knows what's going on. Now, as you mentioned, a lot of people here mentioning idiopathic neuropathy. There's always a cause for the neuropathy. Why do we call it idiopathic? Because we get too bogged down and we don't have the time to actually go back and research. If you actually do a thorough history and physical, you can kind of find out things that may have led to neuropathy. Someone mentioned low B12, and then they've been doing the B12 supplements. Probably with your low B12 over time, that probably contributed to neuropathy. There's also a lot of theories that people are genetically predisposed to have neuropathy. So what we're finding out is more and more and more as we're actually doing genetic testing that we can find traits within people that let us know if you're going to be predisposed to have neuropathy. We can do genetic testing to tell us what neuropathy medications work best on you. So there's a lot of options out there. Uh, years ago it used to be you have neuropathy, there's not a whole lot to do. Soak your feet in uh, cold water if they're burning. If they're cold, put a hot wrap on them. And that was kind of what the doctors would say. Nowadays, we have a whole lot of options from different medications to support groups, which is probably one of the best things we can do when we have chronic pain, to devices, which is one of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, so before we go any further, I'm going to tell you there's a unique quality about me that I can say no other physician in the Round Rock, Austin area can claim. I have successfully treated a patient who was attacked by a tiger and they lived. <laughs> so I grew up in Philadelphia, 18, decided I want to get far, far away from the family, far, far away from Philadelphia. And my parents said, where are you going to go to college? I said, UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. My parents said, why? And I said, mom, they had Larry Johnson, Stacey Augman. They're like winning championships. I'm going to go out and have this great college career, watch all these NBA players come through. And I got out there, and we got sanctioned by the NCAA. And <clears throat> there was no college basketball at UNLV for many, many years. So I said, OK. So while I was out there, I became a paramedic, started working, went to med school in Southern California, came back to do rotations in Las Vegas, and my internship at the trauma center. While I was there, Roy came in when he was attacked by the tiger. So I was one of the interns. So as the intern, you don't get to do a whole lot. You know, the attendings took care of him. All you had to do was make sure the antibiotics were correct, that everything was going fine, and that was it. I will say the day that he got discharged to a rehab center, they loaded him up, and they took five of the interns, and they all put us in stretchers, and they put sheets over us. And the chairman came and said, if you tell anybody that we're doing decoys, I promise you and you'll never work in the U.S. ever again. So they put us all in stretchers, sheets overhead, put us on six different ambulances, and they all took off different ways so the paparazzi couldn't follow him to his rehab center. So that's my story about tiger bites. <laughs> okay, so a big part of the talk today is gonna to be about a device that we can use called spinal cord stimulator and how that can treat and help your neuropathy. When patients have chronic pain, especially neuropathy, and it starts off in the periphery, starts off in your feet or in your hands, and it comes in, and what it does is it creates abnormal inputs into the spinal column. So you have these abnormal inputs coming into the spine, it sends a signal to the brain, the brain takes the signal, sends it back down, says, hey, have burning, have sharp throbbing pain, have cold sensation. We have abnormal sensations all the time from these abnormal inputs coming into the spine. So what I like to say is when we have chronic pain and we have this chronic neuropathy going on, your spine gets unpaced. And I, I always talk about, imagine your heart. If your heart is not beating properly, you go see the cardiologist, they put a pacemaker in, and we get your heart going back the same way. 
Well, a spinal cord stimulator will allow us to do that. So when we start talking about stuff, how long have you been having chronic pain? What are you doing to manage your pain? And how well is it working? If you're seeing a doctor and someone's managing your pain, these are things that you should be discussing at every appointment. Are you getting better or are you stagnant? Are you coming in every month and you're saying, you know, my pain's getting worse, I'm still taking the Lyrica, or I'm taking Grelis, or I'm taking my uh, Hydrocodone, or a Percocet, or whatever they're treating you with, and you're not getting better. You should say, you know, what else can we do? Can we switch things up? Goes back to the DNA. Your doctors can do a DNA swabs on you to let you know how you metabolize medications. About 25% of all Americans don't metabolize hydrocodone, commonly known as Norco or Vicodin. So if you don't metabolize that and we're giving that to you and you're still saying you have chronic pain, no wonder why, you're not metabolizing it, you're not breaking it down. So you should always keep asking every time you go to the doctor, how well is things working? If it's not working well, it's time for a change. So we talk about things that we can do, medications, physical therapy, support groups. Is it reversible or non-reversible? Most neuropathies are non-reversible. Why? Because we catch them too late. You know, we start getting some abnormal sensations in our feet, and we say, ah, oh, I'm just aging, or oh, I mowed the lawn yesterday, and my feet should be hurting, I need new shoes, and we keep pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off. Finally, the pain gets so severe, we go see the doctor, we get diagnosed, and guess what? It's too late to reverse it. Um, common things, vitamin B12. You know, if your doctors are keeping up on your stuff and you're saying, hey, I'm feeling sluggish, something's not right, and we keep monitoring your labs, go, oh, your B12 is really, really low, we need to start getting your B12 shots, there's a chance that could be reversible. In the cases of injury after knee surgery, that's not going to be reversible. Sometimes, as good as the surgeon is when they do an operation, they can help it, but the nerves sometimes get injured, and there's nothing we can do. That's non-reversible. In the case of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, that could be one of the neuropathies that's not totally non-reversible, but it's not totally reversible. Keys there, monitoring your blood sugar, watching your A1Cs. It's been proven that patients who have diabetic peripheral neuropathy, if they keep their A1Cs at 6.5 or lower, they have a slower progression of the neuropathy versus patients who allow their A1C, which is your three month sugar, to be a lot higher. So if you're diabetic and you keep strict, tight control of your glucose, your neuropathy should progress at a slower rate. In the case of post hepatic neuralgia, um, one in 500 people suffer from post hepatic neuralgia. It goes largely untreated. A lot of times will patients come in and they're misdiagnosed. I had a patient who got diagnosed as having what we call thoracic radiculitis meaning he had a herniated disc compressing a nerve coming around, and that wasn't the case. He actually had herpes zoster. He never had a rash. So what do we do? We draw his blood. We look at the antibodies. His antibodies are through the roof. I said, you have herpes zoster. We put him on a couple medications. We put him on a retroviral medication to stop the production of the virus, and guess what happens? He got better. He got weaned off his medicine. We never saw them again. So in the case of post neuralgia, that's one of the neuropathies I like to call that's more on the reversible side. Proper treatment, we can usually get the patients close to pain-free, if not pain-free. So medications, the first line ones are usually what we call um, gabapentin, Lyrica, Grelis, or the three ones out there. Uh, what they are is they're anti-epileptic medications. What we found out is these anti-seizure medications take the rate of firing the nerve and they decrease how the nerve fires. They don't let it to fire as fast. So when we decrease the rate of firing the nerve, hopefully we can decrease the pain that the nerve has. Problem becomes large side effects. Most patients can't handle the proper dose of gabapentin that it takes to handle neuropathy. There was a dose that they came out with of 1,800 milligrams. And there was a study done back in 2001, and they said, okay, what's the number needed to treat neuropathy properly? 
and they said 1,800 milligrams helps most patients in neuropathy. Well, in 2011, they went back and looked at the study and looked at how many patients actually got to 1,800 milligrams. Only 14% of all patients were able to get to 1,800 milligrams. So 86% of all people were on sub-therapeutic doses. Why? Side effects. So side effects is huge. Antidepressants is another one that we use. Again, large side effect profile. The number one agent that we use is amitriptyline or nortriptyline. As we get older, it can cause urinary retention. Maybe a good thing, but if you can't go all the time, that's a bad thing. Um, number two, it can cause a lot of sedation. And then we start going down and we start looking at our last line agents, which is our opiates, our Tylenol with codeine, our hydrocodone, our Percocets, our morphine, our fentanyl patches. What do they do? They're a Band-Aid. Opiates are very, very bad at treating chronic nerve pain. So things that we can try. Physical therapy. Anyone who has a peripheral neuropathy should go through some physical therapy. The reason is, one, I've heard a couple people mention that they've lost some balance and had some balance issues from neuropathy. And the reason because that is, is actually it takes two things for you not to lose your balance. One is your vision. So as long as you can see the horizon, most of the time you should be okay. The second thing is what we call proprioception, or sense of self. So your brain right now knows where my arms are, where my torso is, where my legs and where my feet are, so I don't fall over. A common test that we do in the clinic is we have patients stand there with their arms out and their eyes closed, and you constantly see them all of a sudden do that, fall forward, and we catch them. That's because they can't feel themselves. Their brain no longer knows where their feet is in relation to the body, and therefore they've lost what we call proprioception. Uh, TENS, which is transcutaneous electrical neural stimulation. You can put little pads on your feet and your hands to stimulate. That can help with some of the pain, but you can't wear them 24-7. There's intrathecal delivery devices. This constantly just pumps opiates um, into the CSF or the cerebral spinal fluid. Goes up to your brain and tells your brain, tell the rest of your body not to hurt. This is falling largely out of favor. In the late 80s, early 90s, this was the thing. Everyone who came to a pain clinic who was in chronic pain got an intrathecal trial. So we'd go ahead, put the medicine in your cerebral spinal fluid, You'd say, oh my God, I feel better, great. We take you to the LR, put a catheter in, put a little pump in your stomach. You come back every 30 days, we, ref we refill it. A couple things we found out. Patients who had intrathecal pumps had a higher morbidity and mortality rate. That means chance of death and chance of something bad happening to them increased versus those who didn't. Number two, there's been a lot of errors with filling these devices. There's two ports. There's what we call the reservoir port where the medicine is supposed to go, and there's a port that goes directly into the cerebral spinal fluid. I got called to one of the hospitals because I do some, I tell me, you know, if you have a pain patient, give me a call, I'll come in and help you guys out. Well, there was a patient who was having their pump filled, and it wasn't here in Austin. Um, they were getting their pump filled, and the person filling it injected in the wrong port inject a 30 cc straight into the spinal canal. The patient went into cardiac arrest in the office, was in the ICU for a week on a ventilator. So we're getting away from intrathecal devices. Spinal cord stimulator. This is a great device for neuropathy. It was actually created for neuropathy. It was created back in the 1960s. And it's been evolving and evolving ever since. What a spinal cord stimulator is, it's a pacemaker for your spine. We put two wires into the epidural space, the same space that we put a catheter in when a woman's pregnant and they're in labor, or the same space if you're having near hip surgery nowadays, a lot of times we put a catheter in and they just do it under what we call a regional anesthesia. We just give you some nice medicine in the epidural space, it numbs the whole area. We give you a little bit of medicine just to make you close your eyes, but you're not really asleep. They do your knee surgery or hip surgery and that's it. What this is, we put the wires in there and we stimulate the spinal cord. 
So we're putting the wires above the injury. So if you're having peripheral neuropathy in your feet and legs, the input into the spine is lower. We're gonna put the wires in the middle of your back, stimulate your spinal cord. The analogy I use is imagine a telephone and the telephone wires outside. So if I gave someone here a telephone, I said, give me 30 seconds, we're gonna climb up the pole and I'm gonna hook into the wires up there. And we go one, two, three, we both pick up our phones and dial Domino's Pizza to have pizza delivered to you guys. Whose phone calls are gonna get there faster? Me out on the wire or the person in here with the phone? The answer is me out there on the wire because we have less distance to travel, we're stimulating bigger wires, and we're sending the signal much faster versus your little rinky telephone that's gotta send it to the wall, go through another wire to a larger wire, and eventually to the pole. So what we do is we get a signal to the brain faster. It tells the brain, hey, feel this signal, don't feel a pain, and we replace a painful signal with a massaging sensation. We talked about corrective surgery. Obviously, if you have a herniated disc or you have um, multiple back problems and you need to have surgery, spinal cord stimulation may not be the answer. Your neuropathy may be cured simply by having surgery. But if it's gone too long, we've talked about it, it may not be reversible. So our goal with spinal cord stimulator and our goal with neuropathy is get you back to daily activities. Get you back to walking the mall, walking with your friends around the track, going out to dinner, not being afraid that you can't go out and you're gonna be in pain and that you can't walk or move anymore. It's advanced so much, everything nowadays is wireless. So what a spinal cord stimulator is, is it's a two-step process. And this is one of the reasons why we're pushing this now more than ever for neuropathy patients. One has got zero side effects. It's not like a medication is gonna make you drowsy, it's gonna make you dizzy, it's gonna stop you from urinating, it's gonna make you feel more depressed, all that kind of stuff. There's no side effects from it. It's safe, it's FDA approved. So what happens is, is you see your doctor, your doctor sets you up for a spinal cord stimulator trial. You get to try it before you buy it, is what I tell all my patients. The great thing about this is, is you put a wire into the epidural space, we put a little Band-Aid on, and you have a little wire sticking out from your body to battery pack. And you go home for five to seven days and you try this. You get to turn it on, turn it off, turn it up, turn it down. We've gotten so great with the technology that let's say you have pain in both legs, but your right leg hurts a little bit more than the left. We can actually give you a program that if your right leg's hurting worse than the left, you can turn up just the right leg. If you've had back surgery and you have issues in your lumbar spine and both legs and your back tends to hurt you more than your legs, we can give you a program that increases the intensity or that increases the feeling in the back. If you've had knee surgery and you only have one leg, guess what? we can refine it where we can only capture just that one leg. So there's a lot of technology, a lot of things we can do with this now. So you go home for five days, you get done, you come back, no matter what, that wire comes out, it's a temporary wire, and you and your doctor have a talk about, did it help you? Helping means we're looking for a 50% reduction in your pain score. So we want you during the trial, we don't want you sitting in the chair, we don't want you sitting on the sofa. We don't want you just, oh, I'm gonna relax for these five days. We want you active. We want you out there doing things. What causes you pain? Is it going to the mall and walking the mall or going to the grocery store and walking the grocery store? We want you to do that stuff. We wanna get you out there and see how this is helping your pain. Put it to the test. This is your one and only thing in medicine that we can try with you and it won't have any side effects. So we do this on a Monday, you come in the office on a Friday, you pull the leads. We do this on a Monday and Wednesday afternoon, you say it's just not for you, you come back into your doctor's office and they can pull the leads. So that's a great thing about this technology. Once you get through the trial stage, if the trial is successful, we talk about we do an implant. All an implant is, is a small little battery 
that goes right in your butt. We put the leads back in, and what we do is we tunnel everything underneath the skin. So usually two small incisions, each incision about an inch to an inch and a half big. Here's the greatest thing. These batteries are rechargeable. So you go home, you're using it, it tells you, hey, you gotta recharge me. You pick your favorite show, you sit down, you watch TV, 45 minutes later your battery's charged, you go about your day. The battery life for these is about seven to 10 years. Again, we've done great strides. So now you go seven to 10 years, it's just like a pacemaker. You come in, we do a little battery change, you go home. The nice thing I like about Boston Scientific is they have a little controller. So some other companies have a big device if you have to change your programs. Theirs is using Bluetooth technology. So you pull up the little controller, it samples your battery, you don't have to go back here. You just hold it like a little remote, change it up what you have to do, and that's it. So we talked about the trial. So how do you know what's right for you? This was made for neuropathy. Neuropathy from any cause, be it diabetic, be it traumatic, be it idiopathic, post hepatic neuralgia, um, whatever caused you neuropathy, if you were, grew up in the Northeast and you had an old house that had lead paint and, or you had lead pipes before they were changed out and you had lead toxicity, that can lead to neuropathy. So the first thing is, is having the diagnosis of neuropathy Second thing is, having tried some other options, having tried physical therapy, having done a trial of some of the basic medications that we use. Now, trial doesn't mean of these basic medications that we have to exhaust every option. If you start using some of the medications and you're finding out that these medications are causing side effects, sedation, weight gain, fluid retention, if it happens with one, pretty much it's gonna happen across the board with all of them. So there's no point to just keep switching, switching, and switching that would be a person who would become a good candidate for a spinal cord stimulator. We used to use this as the last resort, and we no longer use it as last resort. This has actually come a lot higher in the algorithm of treating neuropathy nowadays. Reason is, is one, you can do a trial, it's safe, there's no side effects from a trial. The number two, if it works, it can actually help reduce the amount of medications you're taking get you off if you're on a chronic pain medicine, get you off that pain medicine. If you're on high doses of gabapentin or Lyrica, get you off of those medications or at least get them weaned down to more safer doses or doses that will cause less side effects. Um, so chronic pain treatment options. We've kind of talked about the medications and the physical therapy. Uh, okay, so there's a website you can uh, go to, which is the Boston Scientific's homepage, and they have a lot more um, information on there. This was just a quick, brief overview. They actually have something called an ambassador program, where you can actually speak to a patient who has a spinal cord stimulator in, and they can tell you what happened with them. They can tell you their story about the neuropathy, things they tried, what the trial was like, what the implant was like, what the battery swap is like, how it's helped them with their life, how it's allowed them to go out there and become more active and do the things, the activities of daily living that they were unable to do before. Yes and no. So it was designed for peripheral neuropathies. Um, I have done some trials where I've had patients who had chronic pancreatitis and we've done some pancreatic trials. I run about 30% success rate on those. Um, I've used it to treat patients who have chronic angina, who they've been to the cardiologist and the cardiologist says, look, your stress test is normal, your cath is normal, you're on all these medications. We don't understand why you're still having chronic chest pain. And that's a little more successful. We're about 60% success rate with that. With the peripheral neuropathies, we're about an 85 to 90% success rate. Is back pain part of this? Yes. You were talking about your hands. Is 
that affect your hands too sometimes? The neuropathy? Yeah. Most definitely. You can have neuropathy in, in anywhere in the periphery. So some diabetics have what we call stocking glove, where they feel like they, have, they don't have any sensation from their toes to mid-calf, right where their socks are, and they don't have anything from the tip of their fingers to above the wrist where your gloves go. Well, if you can't feel your feet, you become more unbalanced. Now that we put stimulation or a sensation back into your feet, what we notice is with these patients, especially diabetic patients, it cuts down on injuries and ulcers because now they have feeling again. They can feel their toes, they can feel their feet, they know when they've stabbed themselves in their foot, so that's a good thing. Number two, it's helped with their balance because now it's gone back and replaced the proprioception. You can feel your feet and say, oh wow, my feet are right under me or my foot's all the way out to here. Let's bring it back in so I don't stumble and fall. Why can't you have 100% success? So, good question. And the answer is, there's always gonna be some patients that it's just not right for. Um, one of the patients in my practice, she had back surgery, had a spinal fusion, has chronic pain. She had the trial. She said, you know, she felt the feeling in her feet. She felt the feeling in her legs and her back. It just didn't give her enough pain relief into where she was able to take less medications. So what did you do for that patient who couldn't do the spinal stimulus? Um, so for her, we look at other medications, um, try to get her off just the opiates, or there's other different opiates you can use out there that have dual mechanism of action. A new one out there is called Nucinta. That's what I took. So that works. That's a good one. It works on two different pathways. It works on the ascending mu and the descending norepi pathway. So it would just be medicinal then? Um, medicinal. Um, you can always go back and try stimulator a little bit later. Yeah, I did. I had a permanent one in John Wong. I had to have it removed a year later. And then we tried a trial about a year and a half ago, and my arachnoiditis was so progressed they couldn't access the epidural. So they gave it to me as a souvenir. Was it done here in town? Yeah. So I was just wondering. Yeah, I mean, I do a fair amount of these. I haven't had a problem not being able to access the spinal space. What do you think is the best way for those who have had back surgery for chronic pain and they still have their pain? Pretty high success rate. Um, we just did a trial the other day. Actually, he went to implant the other day. It was a gentleman who had uh, 4551 five, fusion and had a laminectomy from L2 and L3. Um, had chronic pain, got sent to me by a spine surgeon to say there's nothing else to do, go see Dr. Kaplan and get your meds from now on. We talked to him about spinal cord stimulator, he did the trial, loved it. Two weeks later we took him back for an implant and he's doing great. Does Medicare cover Yes. That can, yes. So the answer is it might be, but the insurance companies won't cover it because the incidence of a peripheral nerve injury from a knee surgery or shoulder surgery is extremely low. In the case of spine surgery, the reason why they're doing it is because they're going in there and they're fusing, they're taking off their bone. A lot of times we can do some nerve compression accidentally as we're uh, expanding the spine or we're putting our cages in. So what they do is they do the neural monitoring to make sure that we're not compressing the nerves throughout the surgery so that all the signals stay the same. Okay. And that way the patient wakes up with able, you know, we never want anyone to go in for spine surgery and go in there where they walked into the OR and now they're in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. That's not what we want. So the answer is yes. It sends a signal to the brain and sends it back down the nerve pathway. But it takes, the, it takes a signal that's coming from the nerve, whatever the signal is, and amplifies it like an amplifier? No, it actually replaces it. It, it replaces the signal because... So one, one triggers the other. Correct. So the signal coming in from the nerve, okay. if you just have numbness, okay. so you have diabetic peripheral neuropathy, maybe you're lucky and there's no pain, but you just have numbness in your feet. 
what it does is, is now the nerve's coming up and it's an abnormal signal because the nerve's been injured. So what, this, what it does is it says, well, hey, we're not going to stimulate the injured nerve. We're going to stimulate the spinal cord that gives the signal to the injured nerve. And then it says, okay, injured nerve, you don't have to give us a signal anymore. We're going to tell you what signal to have. And that's how it works. It replaces the injured signal with a new signal. But something's got to trigger that replacement signal. And it's a spinal cord stimulator. Okay. It's stimu we're stimulating using electricity. We're stimulating the spinal cord. So we're stimulating the nerves within the spine. So this, the signal is coming from an, an, a peripheral nerve, or what we call a nerve outside the spine. So it's coming in. So now we're saying, OK, well, the spine isn't damaged. It's this nerve that's damaged. So when the nerve comes in within the spinal cord, we have what we call rex lamina, which is the very anterior part of your spinal cord. And that's where all the sensory inputs come in. And that's where we have all what we call the spinal tracks. There's about 20 different tracks within the spinal cord that we've mapped out. So what we do is we stimulate those tracks of the spinal cord. And we say, OK, now we don't need the nerve to function anymore. We're going to tell the nerve how to function. So the only way the nerve isn't functioning is if the nerve's been severed. Right. So as long as, there's an in, as long as there's an intact nerve pathway, we still get signals back down. What happens is sometimes we have to increase the amplitude of the signal that we're providing to the spinal cord. Some patients, we can get away with a very low amplitude. So that means more of the nerve is intact and not injured. Other patients, we have to increase the amplitude because there's been more injury to the nerve. Yes. Um, are there any particular ones that um, increase over time? You know, like if you start with neuropathy just in your feet, does it ever travel? So that's a good question. So some of the neuropathies that get worse over time is one that I mentioned, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. That on its own will get worse over time, and that gets worse if we don't watch our blood sugars. Um, if you've had an injury, so let's say you've had spinal fusion surgery and there's been injury to the nerves, over time, if your spine, you know, if you're not watching your posture, what usually happens is we start getting more and more degeneration in the spine. What can happen there is that can actually worsen too over time. Um, when we say stuff's idiopathic, there's usually a cause for it. Going back to the B12, once we get our B12 straightened out, we're on the proper medications and our vitamins are back up to where they need to be. Usually we see that neuropathy get better and doesn't usually progress as fast. So, um, and I don't know how much time you're speaking, but let's say you have a spinal stimulator. Um, can you, over a few years, go back and see if that's where they're placed? We, we visit it? So yeah, so one, you can go back one, we can do programming and reprogram and retry and see how it works. If we're not capturing all your pain, then it may be that it needs to be moved to a different area. So nowadays, um, the, the newer technology, over the past couple of years, we've come out with newer leads that give us more and more space. The old ones used to be very segmental at one level. So over time, if your pain got worse and we needed to capture a fiber higher up or fiber lower down, you wouldn't be able to. With the new leads that are out there, we can actually they span multiple segments, so you can capture different fibers throughout the years. Is this helpful with arthritis at all? No. So it's only helpful for neuropathy. Arthritis itself is inflammation coming from a joint. The number one thing that's going to help with arthritis is movement. Uh, arthritic patients, when's the worst time? It's in the morning or after your naps. So you wake up in the morning, your whole body feels stiff because your joints have been immobile all night. So the first thing I tell all my arthritis patients is join the Y or find some place that has a pool. And the best thing you could possibly do is aquatic therapy, especially out here our summer. I mean, you can hop in a pool probably now most pools are probably in 80 degrees right now and after a pool. So you can do pool therapy every day where it lightens your weight, so therefore you don't have so much weight on you, so you become more buoyant in the water and you can start keeping all your joints moving. I had a question in regards to aquatic therapy for uh, peripheral neuropathy. Have you found that that can help or lessen or 
approve it in any way, shape, or form if it's like permanent? So if it's permanent neuropathy, it's not going to lessen it. What it can do is keep you more active. We find that the patients who become more inactive, the neuropathy over time becomes worse. And no one knows if that's actually the nerves that are becoming worse because we're not using them, or if it's something central acting because we become inactive, we become depressed, and then that can lead to worsening pain symptoms. So in that case, we want to keep you active. Some people can't do land therapy right off the bat, so that's where aquatic therapy becomes a great option. No. Um, I usually, I don't prescribe B12. Um, I send the patients back to their primary care. Um, a couple things we do in my clinic is we draw a bunch of the labs um, to see where your vitamin D is, where your B12 is, things of that nature. A lot, if that hasn't been done, a lot of times we send you back to the primary and let them treat that aspect of it. Have you hit too much of it? Um, not really. I think uh, if you just do too much, your body just gets rid of it. That's a great question. So I'm one of the only pain docs in Austin who actually treats pelvic pain. Uh, I work with Sullivan Physical Therapy, which is created by Kim Sullivan, and she actually just won an award recently. Um, for one of the best female entrepreneurs in Austin. Um, she has a great staff of physical therapists, and all they do is they treat pelvic pain, male and female. You don't go to them and say, oh, hey, my elbow's acting up, or, you know, hey, my neck's hurting, will you do therapy for that? They don't do that, they only do pelvic pain. So pelvic pain is kind of tough. One, um, I tell my pelvic pain patients, when I was in fellowship, and this was in 2008, 2009, uh, we had a pelvic pain lecture. And our attending stood up, and the first line said, get them out of your practice as fast as you can. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah. He goes, they all have mental problems. They're all crazy. If you see them, get them out of your practice. And that's kind of become still the stigma nowadays. So you don't see a lot of people who treat pelvic pain. So when I moved to town, Sullivan came to me and said, hey, we heard you do some of this stuff. I'm like, yeah. So we started working together. So in the pelvic pain, it's not as easy as to diagnose what nerve it is because there's a lot of nerves. The stimulator can help pudendal neuralgia. You have to place it a little differently. Um, these we actually place, hold on, let me see if I can. So you see where the low back is? Coming down from there, you have the sacrum and the caudal. We actually go into that part, the sacrum and the coccyx is where you put the stimulator leads, and we're actually stimulating the pelvic nerves down there. So that could help SI pain? Not SI pain, because no. um, SI is joint pain. So what this would help is, you know, sometimes women after labor have had an episiotomy, and they have chronic pelvic pain after that. Um, some women who develop IC, interstitial cystitis, have chronic pelvic pain. Um, there's been injuries from horseback riding, to car accidents where they had pelvic fractures and now I've had an injury to the pelvic floor and pelvic nerves. So the stimulator can help that pain. Are any of the patients using acupuncture? Yes. Um, I've had some patients go for acupuncture. Some patients find that it helps reduce the pain. Other patients find that it hasn't helped at all. Um, I think it's very patient dependent and practitioner dependent. I think a lot of people are trying to get into it because it's a new shishi thing to do. But uh, I think at the same point, you have to believe in it and the person has to do it has to be experienced enough in doing it. You know, if you came to my clinic and I write a book on how to do acupuncture, you probably wouldn't get good results. A lot of the literature talks about demyelinization as a cause of peripheral pain. Do you have any idea of what is research So all that means is, is when we look at the nerve, as the nerves get bigger and bigger and bigger, so there's different types of nerve fibers. The small fibers in the periphery are what we call C fibers. They actually don't have a myelin sheath on them. So the signal travels very, very small. As we get closer to the spine and inside the spinal cord, we start getting myelin sheaths around there. And that's why I use the equation 
of the telephone pole and the phone inside the wall. So the telephone pole has a very thick insulation around it, so it allows the signal to travel faster. What happens over time is a demyelinization is we're losing the fat that goes around the nerve, so the signal can't travel as effectively. They were looking at everything from stem cell therapy um, to trying to figure out if they can do nerve replacement therapy. So far, none of this has really worked out. Um, stem cells, you can't traditionally do stem cells in the US. You can get around it by calling it different names, um, but you have to, in, in order to do stem cells, you have to go to Europe. Um, the European trials are so, so right now. Um, you know, if you talk to Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant went and had stem cells put in his knee, and he swears he got him through the last 18 months of his career. Uh, but if you talk to other people who've had the same therapy, they haven't had, you know, that kind of good success. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Is that also progressive like the rest of my neuropathy? Usually not. Usually small fiber neuropathy stays within the small fibers itself. Mm -hmm. um, and it usually doesn't progress. It's the ones that progress are the ones that we can actually control. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy, chemo-induced neuropathy. Those are the ones neuropathies that tend to get worse over time. Usually the small fiber, if it gets worse, it's because we become more and more inactive. If you have the neuropathy pain in your legs and your feet, can you get neuropathy in another part of your body with a different kind of pain? Yes. So as I started off the lecture, we talked about that there may be some genetic reasons why we have neuropathy. And that's what we're looking at now is actually the biggest thing in medicine is looking at genomes and saying, can we predict neuropathy earlier? Do we have to wait until we're 67 years old and say, oh, hey, now we have neuropathy. Could we have predicted this back in the 30s or 40s and said, okay, you're at risk for neuropathy. So let's make sure I don't become a diabetic. Let's make sure every year I see my family doctor, get a checkup, get my you know, labs drawn, make sure that my B12, my vitamin D, everything else is where it should be. So does that mean if you get a different pain in a different part of your body, you should go in to the neurologist perhaps and have it checked? Yes. You're, so I would start with your family practice doctor or your primary care physician and let them check you out first. And then you can either go to the neurologist, you can go to a pain practitioner uh, and kind of get worked up from there. Should we tell our children about the neuropathy? So maybe it is genetic? Yeah. Most definitely. I mean, if you're a diabetic, that's, that's genetic. So if you're a diabetic, we know that diabetes is, is genetic, it's inherited. So we should say, okay, look, you know, watch your sugar intake. Don't be drinking sodas. Watch your carbohydrates late at night, yada, yada, yada. You know, if it's, you know, what we're calling idiopathic, truly, it's not all idiopathic. Again, if we go back and do a good history and physical, we can probably pick up something back of what set the neuropathy off. Well, there's no other questions. I want to thank everybody for having me out today. I appreciate being able to come out and talk to everyone, and hopefully we can raise awareness for neuropathy here in the Austin Round Rock area.